Right, so I'm gonna introduce our speaker. Uh, this is Brandy Blue. Some of you may recognize Brandy. Uh, she is our senior admission specialist here in the Burnett Honors College, but uh, she has also been teaching GRE prep for quite some time. And uh, so she has uh, a lot of knowledge to share with you about how to prepare for the graduate record examination. Uh, so Brandy, thanks for coming. And she's gonna tell you a little bit about how she's gonna run her session. All right, thanks Rex and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm very excited to be able to share um, my knowledge about the GRE exam with all of you today. Um, in terms of if you want your camera on, if you want your microphone on, if you wanna interrupt me talking at any point to ask questions, please do so. Otherwise I'm going to be talking to you all for you know an hour, an hour and a half by myself and that gets kind of boring. So you are welcome at any point to ask questions, whether you wanna type them in the chat or ask them through the Zoom room, you can definitely do that or raise your hand or however method you wanna to use to get my attention to make me take a break from talking to answer your questions. Very happy to do that. Um, and so I guess I'll go ahead and share my screen now so that I can share my PowerPoint presentation. All right, hopefully that looks good for everyone. I'm also going to make sure I can see the chat in case chat questions come up. All right, so, um, Again, um, hopefully you're here to learn more about the uh, GRE exam. The current version of it is called the revised GRE, but they revised it back in like 2011. So this is pretty much the version of the GRE we've been using for about 10 years now. As Rex mentioned by day, I'm the honors admission specialist for the honors college, but I also did quite a bit of teaching um, for the GRE exam. I say former at this point, I'm currently on hiatus for teaching, so I'm not teaching right now, spending more time with my family, but um, you know, something I hope to return to um, in the future. All right, so you may be wondering who should take the GRE exam. Um, it's a very widely used exam for admission into graduate school. You can kind of think of it as the SAT for graduate school and many graduate school programs. In fact, I did both SAT and GRE prep and the material on both exams um, is pretty darn similar. Um, if anything, I think the math is harder on the SAT because there's more of it and uh, the verbal is uh, harder on the GRE, but it's very similar to that. So that's a good way to kind of approach it. It can be used for admissions to, you know, master's programs, PhD programs, even some MBA programs will accept the GRE instead of the GMAT. What you should do is reach out to the program you plan to apply to and ask them, do they require a GRE exam and do they consider a GRE exam score? And when you're doing that, you may want to ask, is there a minimum GRE required or what is the average GRE required for admission into your program? Because that can kind of give you an idea of what score you would want to be aiming for. So what do we need to know about the GRE exam? I'm going to talk about the format of the exam, functionality when you're taking the exam, how score reports and the score scaling works, um, and then the content you can expect to see on the GRE exam. And then the reason this is kind of a long workshop is because I will also cover some sample questions at the very end to kind of show you what types of questions you may see from the different areas on the GRE, so questions as well as their answers. Okay, so on to format and functionality. The GRE is a computer-based test. Um, so if you go to take it in a testing center, they will provide um, scratch paper and pencils for you. Um, there's a basic calculator program built in. Kind of think of the calculator function on your like uh, Windows menu. Very, very basic calculator is provided for the math sections. Um, you are not allowed to use your own calculator. You've got to use the one baked into the program. Um, you are able to change and edit your answers. You're able to skip questions and come back to them. Um, so you do have the ability to look at a question and say, mm, that looks hard. I'm going to come back to that one without being penalized. Um, you can even mark questions to make it easier to go back and find them later. Um, something um, that's nice for this test is there is no penalty for incorrect answers. You obviously won't get the points for having gotten it right if you get it wrong, but you can guess. And so when you are taking the GRE exam, you should have an answer in every question because there's no reason not to. Because any percent chance is better than a zero percent chance of getting the right answer. <clears throat> So where can I take the test? Um, you can take it at a testing center or they launched for this past year. You can take the GRE exam from home. 
Um, so if you do decide to take the exam from home because you don't want to go be touching a computer that might have been touched by a whole bunch of other people in this pandemic, um, you should know that it's the same exact um, test that you would see when taking it in a testing center. Um, you would take it at home and you would be monitored by somebody, an actual person will watch you take the test through your computer's camera. So you do have to have a camera available to be able to take the exam from home. Um, it's available around the clock seven days a week. So it does add a lot of flexibility for scheduling when you're going to take the GRE. Um, you can learn more about taking the GRE exam at home at the GRE website. And I've provided the link here in this PowerPoint. Um, there's a little video that they sh that you can watch that'll tell you about what you need to have on your computer to do the taking the test from home. Um, and uh, you know all the information you might need if you want to consider that as an option. Um, let's see, somebody asked in the chat, is there a fast time limit? Um, the, there's different time limits, the different sections of the exam that I'm going to cover. Um, but the nice thing about it is if you finish the section early, you can move on. You don't have to sit there for the length of time for that section of the exam. Um, but there is a limit on how many minutes you have to answer each of the questions in each of the different sections. Um, if you go to a testing center to take the exam, you can expect to spend about four and a half hours at the testing center between the check-in process and sitting through taking the exam. All right, so test format, here's where the uh, timing comes in. So you'll have um, the analytical writing section um, is basically your essay section. That section always comes first. And there's two different writing tasks. You have 30 minutes to write the issue task and 30 minutes to analyze the argument. Um, so you have an hour to do the writing section, two separate essays. Um, again, this section will always be first. And then you'll have five more sections that will be in a random order. So you'll have two verbal reasoning sections, which will be 30 minutes each. They won't necessarily be back to back. Um, you'll have two quantitative reasoning sections, aka math sections. Those will be 35 minutes each. And then you'll have one section that does not count towards your score. It is a research section. Um, so this is a section that they can use to test out different types of test questions um, to kind of get a feel for new ones. So they won't count against you. Um, they may or may not tell you that it is a test section. Um, so when I took my GRE a uh, long while ago, um, mine was clearly identified because I took the version before the revised GRE and I did not have a calculator available to me. I had to do all my math by hand. And so this section actually had the calculator built in. So uh, that's how I knew, aha, this is not going to be a real section because it has a calculator here. Um, and so you may or may not be told which one is the research section. So if you are not told it is the research section, count it as if you think it will be graded. If they tell you it's a research section, then feel free to put as much or as little effort into it as you want. Um, there are break times built into the test as well. You do get a 10 minute break after the third section, you know, whatever type of section that ends up being, that ends up being about the middle of your exam. And you do have a, up to a minute to take a break between each of the other sections. Um, and as I said, of course, if you finish early, then you can use that time as a break if you need to, um, instead of moving on to the next section. It's really up to you. So unlike the SAT, again, you're not forced to sit there in a room while everybody else finishes the same section. You're taking this computer-based test on your own time. So if you're ready to just plow ahead and move on to the next section, you can do that. Uh, Brandon, we have another question. Did you catch that? Yep. Sorry. Um, so the best period of time to apply for the GRE, I think I'm going to cover that one in a couple of slides. So when I get to that, I'll address it and make sure that I did answer that question. But that is a good question. Um, all right. So the scoring scale. Um, so scores for the GRE with this revised version of the GRE adopted a new scale. They used to be graded like the SAT on 1800, 1800 combined for 1600, but now it's a scale of 130 to 170 for your verbal score and then a score of 130 to 170 for your math score in one point increments. So you can have a total score anywhere from 260 to 340. The writing section is a separate six point scale graded in half point increments. 
They don't add the writing score to your total score. It is a separate six point thing. Um, the reason they changed the scale um, was for comparison. That way you only have maybe a one point difference in a score between somebody rather than a 10 point difference for answering a question differently. Um, you may be asking, so then what's a good score? Well, really that depends. Um, it depends on what program you're applying to. It depends um, sometimes on which section certain programs value the quantitative section more highly, like of course, computer science programs or physics programs, um, writing programs might care more about your writing score than other programs will um, and so things like that. So really the best way to get an idea again of what score you should be aiming for, reach out to the program you're applying to. First ask, is there a minimum GRE score? And then ask, what is the average GRE score um, for the students admitted to your program? Because that'll give you an idea. The average gives you a better idea of what a competitive score will be for your program. Um, so score report timeline, um, you will always see an unofficial score for your verbal section and your quantitative section immediately after submitting your test. Um, now you can choose which sittings to send to the schools you're planning to apply to. So there really isn't much of a reason to not go ahead and submit your tests and see what score you get, unless you really, 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 really think you bombed it. And like, there's no way you got above a, you know, 180, um, you know, maybe then don't, but for the most part, go ahead and submit your scores. That way you can get your unofficial score. Your official scores will be available in 10 to 15 days after your exam. And you can see your scores online through your ETS account, which is through the GRE website. You'll have to create an ETS account to actually register for the GRE exam. And you'll use that ETS account to see your scores, um, to use the score select program to decide which scores to send to your programs you're applying to. Um, and also some review materials are available there as well. Um, do note that some graduate programs may require you to submit all scores from all sittings of the GRE exam, so you may want to ask your program about that in advance if you're concerned that you may need more than one sitting to reach your desired score. Um, we tend to find that honors students tend to do pretty well on the GRE um, because, again, it's just like a grown-up SAT for the most part. But if you're that worried about it, do reach out to the program that you're applying to. And we do encourage you to register early um, for a seat for the exam. Even if you're taking it at home, be mindful they have to have a human person available to watch you through the exam. So that's why there are still, um, you know, an appointment to take it, not just taking it at home on your own time. So the earlier you register to take the test, the more likely it is you will get the day of the week and the time of the day that works best for you and your schedule. Um, when you're registering for the test, you know, keep in mind what kind of person you are. If you're not a morning person, then you may not want to take the GRE at 8 a.m. because your brain doesn't function yet. Um, if you're not an afternoon person, you know, maybe you do want to take it in the morning. You want to get it over with and be able to do whatever you want for the rest of the day. So you can pick and choose, you know, what time um, you take the exam. So pick the time of day that works best for you. All right. So when should I take the GRE? Um, keep in mind, scores are good for five years. So don't, you know, take the GRE so early that it, they won't, the scores won't be relevant when you actually apply to your program. Um, you'll also want to make sure you pick a date that allows the official score reports to get to the school of your choice by the deadline. Again, those official score reports are available 10 to 15 days after your exam. So you want to take it at least two to three weeks before the deadline and, you know, ideally earlier in case you need time for a retake. Um, you can take the test once every 21 days, um, no more than five times within a calendar year, 365 days, okay? After you take the test, um, you do have access to a GRE diagnostic tool. This is a free service they provide to help you understand your performance from previous tests. Um, they give you an idea of which types of questions you tend to get right, which types of questions you tend to get wrong. So if you do need to study for a retake, you can have an idea of what types of questions you might want to focus your study time on. So make sure you take advantage of that free resource if you end up needing to retake the GRE exam. Um, so again, time to apply to take the GRE, you know, probably sometime in your senior year. So that way you have those scores in place when you're ready to apply for grad programs. You can do it in junior year as long as you plan to attend graduate school within, you know, three years of graduating. Because again, those scores are good for five years. 
And so then now the next question might be, how long should I spend preparing for the GRE exam? That's really a personal decision for our students because it depends a lot on how much free time you have, um, how much math you might need. If it's been a while since you've taken a math class, you know, you might need to spend a little more time remembering how do I find the area of a triangle, which may be something you haven't had to do since, I don't know, high school or maybe even middle school, um, or how much vocabulary you may need depending on how much reading you've been doing for your major. You don't want to start studying too far in advance from your GRE date because you might lose that sense of urgency. You might start studying, get bored, take a break, and then forget to come back to it until right before the test. Um, you also want to make sure you do give yourself enough time so that you um, aren't panicking um, about, you know, not having enough time to study. Um, I personally Due to life circumstances, I ended up deciding in September um, that I wanted to go to grad school in January. And so I signed up for the GRE exam the following month in October. For me, that was a good length of time, a month, because I, even though I'd had been out of school for a while, I was out of school for about five and a half years before I decided it was time to go back to grad school. But a month was a good length of time for me because it was soon enough that I kept that sense of urgency and I was able to cover everything I needed to in that month period. Um, you know, I, I think anywhere from three to six weeks is probably ideal for most honor students in preparing for the GRE. Again, it's really just remembering how to do math and adding vocabulary. Um, but of course, if you need longer, you can certainly do that. Um, oh, a good question. Um, I have said the GRE is a lot like the SAT in many ways, um, but they do not super score GRE scores from my understanding. Um, so if you take it multiple times, they don't generally pull your highest math and your highest reading. Apparently I'm not moving enough. Okay, there it goes. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, when you do support report your scores, it is by sitting, not by section. Although if of course a school is evaluating, they can see maybe that you did better in one section one time versus the other. Um, so it might be worth it to send both scores so they can see that. But in general, when they report scores, it's from a single sitting. But ask the program you're applying to because they may work differently. Um, okay, so. All right, so now that I've talked about how long you should spend preparing, um, you may want to know, well, what can I do to prepare for the revised GRE? Um, I think the first step for everybody should be to take a diagnostic test. Um, diagnostic tests are often available in, you know, pretty much all the main GRE prep book providers, or you can just take a practice test online, either from the GRE website um, or from other sources out there. Just get an idea of where you're at. So don't study, just take a diagnostic test, see where you're at. Then review that diagnostic test and get a feeling for, you know, where you need to work. I mean, if you ace the diagnostic test, then hooray, you probably don't have to spend much time preparing for the GRE. Um, but you may find that, oh, wow, I really don't remember geometry. Or, wow, I'm really struggling with these sentence equivalence questions. These are weird. Um, so it can kind of give you an idea of where to focus your efforts. Um, you should, prep books are really great. I think they do a great job of breaking down the different sections of the GRE test. Um, what to expect in each of the different sections, what math you're expected to know and things like that. Um, so for me, it was really effective to work through a prep book. Um, do practice questions by content area. So, you know, refresh your arithmetic knowledge, do arithmetic questions, refresh your algebra knowledge, do algebra questions, um, you know, refresh, how do I do reading comprehension? Do reading comprehension questions. So practice within the content area rather than just taking practice tests over and over. That way, again, you can kind of focus on finding where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, and uh, adjust your study time appropriately. Once you've got all the different content areas down, then do practice tests. Um, paper tests, you know, if you can find them. Um, and then do at least one computer-based practice test before the GRE. If you are not used to taking a computer-based test, um, there's some quirks to it that, make it a little bit harder. For example, you can't just like draw on, cross out answers that you don't like because it's on the computer screen. So it's not like you can sit there and draw on the computer screen to eliminate answers. You may to get efficient at using scratch paper to make your notes and keep track of what answers you want to consider and which ones you don't want to consider. 
Um, so, and get used to working your way through the program, skipping questions, moving back, navigating. Um, Cause that program, you know, has been around a while. It feels a little older, may feel a little clunkier than some of the programs we're used to using nowadays. So you don't want to spend time on test day fighting the test itself. So taking a, a practice-based computer test can help you get familiar with navigating that type of test format. And then if you do all of these things, then you should be ready to ace the GRE, okay? Um, and there are a lot of resources available on the GRE website itself. Um, a lot of the um, teaching I did in my prep classes, um, I brought information straight from the source. I mean, they're the guys that produce the test. They're the ones that make the questions. They have a lot of good information on how to prepare. Um, and one of the programs they have available, Power Prep Online, they do have a free um, version of an online test you can take. So when you're asking, hey, where do I find an online test to do my final prep? straight to the source, use their online version of the test because it will give you the best feel of what it will actually be like on test day. Um, they do have a paper-based test book available. They have um, Khan Academy math stuff linked there as well. So feel free to explore their other free resources. There are a lot of free resources on the GRE website. There's some paid stuff, but I think you can get enough out of the free resources. Um, there's a website called magoosh.com slash GRE. Their uh, tutoring service, if you go to their website, they will constantly splash you with windows. Please pay for our tutoring services. And you don't need their paid tutoring services. Just go through their instructor blogs. They post a lot of really interesting articles and constantly about stuff that's relevant to the GRE. I just read one the other day that was talking about what makes a good score. And it actually broke down different percentiles of scores for different level of, levels of competitiveness for different types of grad programs. So you can find information right there on their instructor blogs, you know, what makes a good score. Um, they also have, you know, practice math questions and their explanations, practice verbal questions and their explanations, commonly used words and how to differentiate between them on the GRE exam. So again, you can get a lot out of their website without paying them a single dime. Um, so again, I don't work for Magoosh. I'm not trying to get them money, but I do encourage you to utilize their instructor blogs because they've been really, really helpful. Um, some other useful websites. Um, Wordnick.com um, is useful for looking up words. I mean, yes, you can use Webster Dictionary and things like that. But what I liked about Wordnick, um, A, you can get it as an app on your phone as well. So it's really easy to just look up words as you run across them as you're trying to learn new words. Um, they also use, um, you know, use the word in real life sentences, like they pull from actual published uses of the words, not just making up a sentence for how it's used, um, and talk about how the, you know, the etymology of the word, where did it come from, because I think the, the biggest battle with the verbal section is the vocabulary. You're going to have to remember or learn a lot of new words, I think, to be successful. And so you should get in the habit as you're reading anything for any class to just start looking up words you're not familiar with instead of just skating by on, I think I know what that means. I've got a good enough understanding of it. As you run into a new word, look it up. Get the actual definition. Check for secondary definitions, tertiary definitions. Again, see how it's used in real life, in the real world, in the wild. And I think Wordnik does a good job of kind of combining a lot of that in one resource. So look words up. And then aldaily.com provides a lot of reading material. Again, these are free. Um, reading material from a lot of different subject areas. Um, because when you are taking the GRE exam, there will be reading comprehension questions. And they'll cover topics from biology to education to history um, to literature review. And so it's good to train yourself on how to read in different subject areas. Because um, at this point, most of you have probably been in your major for a while. So you're used to reading things that are relevant to your degree program. And your brain might, you know, get a little scared of reading something that's outside of your comfort zone. So it's kind of like exercise for your brain, you know, practice with it, train your brain to not panic when you see a biology article, for example. So AL Daily has a lot of different things you can read about from a lot of different subjects and uses a good level of vocabulary that will help you with the GRE. I mentioned prep books. Um, I personally used the Barron's GRE book, and that was the one that was the recommended text for when I was teaching test prep courses. Um, but there's a lot of others out there. Um, a lot of them are pretty great. That Magoosh website actually at one point had a good article explaining the different types of test prep books that are out there. There are pros and cons, so maybe you can check that out to get an idea of which book might work best for you. 
Um, but I like the idea of a book because, again, it keeps it structured. Um, it helps you progress through what you need to work on and almost always provides at least a diagnostic test, if not also additional practice tests. There are test prep courses out there. Um, so when it comes to test prep courses, I tend to recommend those more for students who need somebody to tell them what to do to study for this test, who need who can lay out a study plan for them, for them to follow, and who needs somebody to kind of work the math out in front of them or talk about the reading in front of them. Um, I personally didn't use a, a prep course. I just did self-study from a book and practice questions and things like that. And I did just fine, obviously, because they hired me to uh, do GRE prep for them. But I, courses can be really useful if you want that structure, want somebody else to provide that structure for you, if that kind of um, will make you stick to it, so to speak. Um, UCF test prep is a nice, uh, cheaper version of test prep courses. They're a lot cheaper than Kaplan and Princeton, and they even offer UCF student and UCF alumni discounts. Um, so if you want to go for a cheaper test course, um, UCF test prep is a great choice for that. Um, and I think they even offer some online versions of it now as for using their website again, um, due to, of course, the pandemic, there are online versions available of their classes too. So it doesn't always have to be face-to-face. -face. As you're preparing for the GRE, if you have a quick question, you can always email me directly at brandy.blue at ucf.edu. You run into a math question and you're not sure why they got that answer. You run into a reading comprehension question, you're not sure how they got that answer. Feel free to send those problems and questions to me and I will do my best to break it down and explain to you, you know, why this is the answer, why these other ones are not the right answer. Um, it's always a nice brain break from my usual day-to-day -day tasks. And if it's a math question, I'll probably even drag Rex in on it too, because Rex has also done math test prep as well. All right. All right, so now we're going to go section by section. Um, does anyone have questions about the overall test format um, or anything that I've talked about so far before I get into the section by section content? Hi, Brandy, this is Min. I had a few questions. Yes. So regarding taking the GRE at home, mm -hmm. is there a... Mm, I guess like a technological requirement, like do we need to have like, let's say a computer instead of a laptop for the webcam? Does it have to be like a certain quality of webcam and like how much space like is actually being shown right. for when so, taking the test at home? So what I saw um, from watching the little, cause this was kind of a new thing to me to discover too, um, cause it's a newer thing they added. Um, you do need to have a webcam that will allow you to show the proctor a 360 view of your room. So they can make sure you don't have like a whiteboard with formulas up on the wall or something like that. Um, and then when you're taking the exam, the camera needs to show you in frame the, the entire time. Um, so it needs to be a camera that does that. You'll also need to be able to download their ProctorU um, browser to make sure that you're not like opening up other web pages and things like that, that you're just looking at the GRE test. So when you, tr if you try to register for the exam at home, there is a, like a, a check, uh, not, what's the word I want? Standards check, basically. They, they have something that you can run so they can make sure that your computer is capable of running all the things you'll need to run to be able to do the exam from home. And so if you, you know, go to try to register from home and you don't meet one of the things they need you to have, they'll be sure to let you know. They won't just be like, let you sign up and then say, nope, we're going to throw your test out the window. Okay, thank you. So in that case, if we wanted to take the GRE at home, we'd have to go buy a 360 camera? We just need to be able to move the camera around. I don't know if they'll let you like stand up with your laptop and turn around with it or if they require an actual swiveling camera. Okay, got it. Yeah, because I was wondering if like, oh, if we have a webcam in our laptop, that's probably not going to be okay. So yeah. I think they prefer a web, uh, an actual camera that you can point around for them so they can see everything. Oh, okay, got it. So if we have like a separate web camera that's like detachable from somewhere and just spin it around occasionally for them, that might work. Yeah, I think it's just at the beginning they're going to ask you because they want to make sure they observe your testing environment. When you're just taking the test, it's going to just be pointed at you the whole time. So they just want to make sure that before you start the test that you don't have, like I said, a whiteboard with, you know, formulas up on the wall or something like that, um, or any, any sort of unapproved materials during the test. Okay, got it. And um, would we need, like, 
audio recording? Like, would I need to have like a headset on and things like that for them Actually, to have access to my audio? Yeah, headsets are not allowed, okay. um, but you do have to have a microphone so you can talk to them, um, but they do not allow you to have a headset. So you have to have okay. some so it would be the microphone, like, let's say if I use my laptop in my yes. laptop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you for the clarification. Of course. Um, then I see in the chat a question, do they have a formula sheet in the program? No, you will have to memorize the formulas yourself. Um, I'm going to bring this up a little later in the presentation, um, but I guess I'll go ahead and mention it now. Um, all the formulas you need to know can be fit on one page of paper because I've done it and I have a, a formula cheat sheet, not for you to use during the exam, but for you to use as you're preparing for the exam. Um, so if you want to email me at brandy.blue at ucf.edu, I'm happy to email you this formula sheet. Normally I would hand it out if this you know, workshop was happening in person, um, but since it's not, I'm happy to email it to everyone. Um, the formulas are mostly stuff from high school math, essentially. Um, you just need to know up through like intermediate algebra in order to be successful on the GRE exam. Um, but it does mean that you do need to remember some geometry formulas, like what's the area of a triangle? What's the area of a rectangle? Um, how do 30, 60, 90 triangles work? How are their sides related? Um, those are some of the more complicated formulas you'll need to remember. Um, you don't need to know the quadratic formula. You don't need to know how to find the derivative of anything like that. Um, it's really basic high school math. And actually, if, you know, if you're advanced honor students and we're taking advanced high, um, math in high school, it might even just be middle school math for you. Um, so you do have to review your formulas and know them. And again, I'm happy to provide that sheet to anybody who emails me so that you can study those formulas. Okay. Um, other questions before I move on to content by area? Okay. So, I'm going to go section by section. As I mentioned, the first section is the analytical writing section. This is where you're going to write a couple of essays, two writing tasks. There's 30 minutes on presenting a perspective on an issue task and 30 minutes on analyzing an argument. Presenting an issue um, or presenting on the issue task is basically the type of writing you've done forever. It's make an argument. You're presented with an issue. Your job is to come up with some sort of thesis statement on this issue and then support it, okay? Um, very straightforward writing. Make your argument, support it. The analyzing an argument task is a little more unique in that you are presented with an argument that somebody has already written and your job is to pick it apart for any flaws in logic or reasoning, any misuse of um, statistics or data basically find the flaws in it. I found the best resource for the analytical writing section is the GRE website itself. They have a lot of really useful things there, such as the grading rubric, what makes a six, what makes a five, what makes a four, and the, the specifics that they're looking for. You can also find sample graded essays. Um, they provide a topic and they say, okay, this is what an essay that was graded six looked like. This is an essay that was graded five. This is an essay that was graded four. So as you read those graded essays, I think they do a really good job of showing where the difference lies in the different uh, score levels. Um, so I encourage you to look through those. You can actually even find all the prompts, the ones that can show up on test day are there on the website. Um, that being said, there's about 200 prompts for the issue task and 200 um, prompts for the argument task. So, I mean, you can write practice essays from there to prepare if you need to, but the odds are you probably won't see the one that you had on, have on test day unless you get really, really lucky. Um, and so you're basically going to want to follow the five paragraph essay structure for this. Um, and what I mean by that is tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them what you just told them. You want to make it clear that you know how to organize your argument, that you can support your argument, that you didn't miss any steps along the way. So try to stay in order when you're writing the analytical writing essays um, and just make sure you support whatever argument you make. Um, if you make a statement, make sure you support it with some sort of evidence. Um, is it possible to write five paragraphs in 30 minutes? You may not actually get to five paragraphs and that's okay. Um, they know that it's a 30 minute task, so they're not ex expecting polished writing from you. They know this is a first draft, but you do need to make sure that you get the ideas out on page, that you use the English language well in expressing your ideas, that you use a variety of sentence structure and vocabulary in saying what you're going to say. Um, you know, you can, 
skim your essay at the end looking for grammatical errors, but those will be minor unless they make it impossible for you to understand the essay. The main thing they're looking for is that you've organized an essay, you made a point, you supported it, and then told them what you just told them. Um, when it comes to the writing section, honestly, most grad schools, most grad programs don't put heavy emphasis on the analytical writing section because they know that it tends to value the five paragraph essay, which is such a formula based writing. Um, the programs that may care more about it are English writing programs or philosophy programs, especially for that analyzing an argument task. Um, it, I wouldn't be afraid to reach out to your program and ask, you know, what's the average write a analytical writing section score for your incoming class. If they say, I don't know, then they probably don't care that much about the analytical writing section of the GRE exam. Um, so you can keep that in mind and how much effort you wanna put into it. If they can spout an answer off right away, then it may be a program that pays closer attention to that score and you may wanna put a little more effort. But essentially, if you can make an argument, support the argument, stay in order, stay organized, um, it's we're pretty much going to get above a four on the analytical writing section. A score of three or below is really if your argument starts to break down, if you make statements without supporting them, or if you can't seem to make an argument at all, that's where um, you'll start seeing the scores get to be three or lower. Again, read those uh, graded essays on the GRE website. They do a really good job of showing exactly what it is they are looking for um, in the analytical writing section. Okay. Any other... Oops. Sorry about that. Any other questions on the analytical writing section? Again, it's going to get the least amount of my attention because it's the score that is usually analyzed the least by grad programs. Um, but if you have more questions about the analytical writing section, um, I'm happy to you know, either answer them now or if you want to email me about them, I can answer them via email for you. Okay. Um, verbal section. So the verbal section, you have two graded session or sections. They are 30 minutes each, 20 questions per section, okay? And the question types you'll see on the current version of the GRE are reading comprehension, sentence equivalence, and text completion. Um, the old version of the GRE, which is the one I took, had analogies and antonyms on it. So if you are randomly Googling for resources and you run into verbal questions that have analogies or antonyms in them, you can safely ignore it. That's old material. Um, which is nice because the analogy and the antonyms were really mean because if you didn't know the words, there wasn't really much you can do with those questions. At least now it's all about words in context. Okay. <clears throat> so reading comprehension questions, they make up about half of the verbal questions you'll see on the GRE exam. Um, there's some that are traditional multiple choice. Here's a question about what you just read. Pick the best answer. Um, you may see some that require one or more correct answer, multiple choice, select all that apply. And you may see a unique type, which is select text and passage. This will say, you know, pick the sentence that best conveys the following statement or pick the statement in the passage that best answers this question. Um, and when you have those, you'll just click on the sentence in the passage that you want to use to answer that question. And that's how you answer it. So you won't have like A, B, C, D to choose. You'll actually click a sentence in the paragraph, okay? Um, text completion questions are going to be about a fourth of your verbal questions. These will be sentences that have one to three blanks and a column or one to three columns of words to choose for each of those blanks. So basically fill in the blank questions. Okay. Um, and then there's sentence equivalents. These ones have one word missing and you need to pick the two words in the sentence that complete the sentence with a similar meaning, okay? So for sentence equivalence questions, you'll pick two answers that give the sentence the same meaning. And you can tell the difference between text completion and sentence equivalence because text completion will have ovals in front of the answer choices. So that tells you you just wanna pick one from this group. Sentence equivalents will have boxes in front of the words. If you see boxes in your answer choices, that means you may want to pick more than one answer. For sentence equivalents, it means you want two answers, exactly two, no more, no less. Um, for like reading comprehension, it may be select all that apply. You pick one, two, three, um, at least one of them, okay? Um, there is no partial credit on these text completion or sentence equivalents that can have more than one answer. So you want to do your best to pick all of the correct answers and only the correct answers in order to receive credit for that question, 
Okay. Okay. So tips for preparing for the verbal questions section um, for reading comprehension. It may seem like reading comprehension are the easiest questions, um, but they can be kind of tricky because we're sometimes we're so used to skimming material um, just to kind of get through a paragraph or get through a book or get through a reading assignment for class. So you may need to train yourself to really get in the practice of reading something short that maybe you're not all that interested in and really retaining what you're reading. Okay, so practice reading and paying attention to what you're reading. Um, see if you can, you know, summarize what you just read. Um, even before you start answering questions, just get used to practicing reading and being able to summarize what you just read without it instantly flying out of your head. Um, so read for comprehension, not just to get to the end of it. Um, when you're checking for your answers for um, the reading comprehension, make sure you can support your answer from the text. Even if you like an answer, if you can't find something in the text specifically that tells you why this is the right answer, it may not be the best answer. So you want to make sure you can support your answer from the text. There are two different types of reading comprehension questions. The traditional questions are things like, what's the main idea? What can be inferred from this paragraph? Um, you know, what specific detail is the author trying to convey here? Kind of your, your normal questions, so to speak. And then there's logical reasoning questions. These actually mimic a lot of questions you might see on the LSAT exam, um, where they ask you to find the flaw in the author's conclusion or pick a statement that would strengthen or weaken the author's argument. When you're doing a traditional type question, you're just looking for information from the text, trying to support it from the text. When you're doing the logical reasoning questions, you may need to think more about what's not there. You know, what conclusion did the author reach if they didn't actually state that clearly in the section? Um, and you can also approach it from maybe, maybe this isn't true. What in here could be wrong or false, okay? Um, so you may wanna be looking, you read, those passages tend to be shorter. So you wanna read them even more carefully looking for flaws in logic and flaws in argument, okay? Because that's usually gonna be the key to answering these types of questions. And then it's really helpful in the verbal, or I'm sorry, the reading comprehension questions to know what makes wrong answers wrong. And I have a slide on that, there we go. So what makes a wrong answer wrong? Because if answers do any of these things, no matter how much you like that answer, it is not going to be the right answer. Okay, so if you can identify what makes an answer wrong, it can be easier to use a process of elimination to figure out which answer must be the right answer. So watch out for answers that are too extreme. Answers that say all or every or never tend to be too extreme and are not likely to be the right answers here. Um, because these reading comprehension passages are based on academic text. And as you probably know, academics are very hesitant to make all or nothing type statements. So there's always that little wiggle room to acknowledge that we may not know everything. So extreme answers that say all or every or never are almost or pretty much never the right answer. So stay away from those. Watch out for answer choices that assume too much. If you're having to pull in outside knowledge of things you know from other classes to pick that as your answer, that may not be the right answer because the idea is you should be able to answer this question knowing absolutely nothing about the subject matter. You should be able to pull all of it just from the passage you've just read. So if you are pulling in outside knowledge from other classes, don't pick that answer. Watch out for answers that may be partially right, or in, but also partially wrong. Like, you know, this half of the apple is nice and shiny and looks great, but this other half is rotten. That rotten half is gonna ruin that whole apple. The wrong part of the answer ruins the entire answer. So don't pick an answer that is even partially wrong, because if it's partially wrong, it's entirely wrong. It's not the answer you want. Look for, or look out for answers that go beyond the scope of the passage. Um, if the answer talks about things that is beyond what the passage talks about, goes into a completely different area of knowledge, probably not gonna be the answer you're looking for. Because again, it's supposed to be based on the passage you just read. A very common question type is, you know, what's the main idea? What's the main topic here? Um, so watch out for main topic statement answers that are either too broad or too specific. The correct answer will cover all of the paragraphs in a passage and only the paragraphs in the passage. So make sure it covers everything you've read about without going beyond it. And that's gonna be your best choice for those types of answers. 
Um, and then watch out for answer choices that may be true statements, but don't answer the question. Um, if they don't actually answer the question being asked, it's not the answer choice, even if it is a true statement. So just don't just rely on it being true. Oh, well, then that must be the right answer. Not necessarily. It actually has to answer the question. So when it comes to reading comprehension, the correct answer is the one that most accurately and most completely answers the question that's being asked. Okay. Okay. Uh, there we go. Sorry about that. So that's reading comprehension. And the best, really the best practice for reading comprehension is just to read. Read from a variety of different fields, read um, a variety of different things. And as you're reading, make sure you're looking up new words as you run across them. Because again, you don't want to rely on just, I think I know what that word means. If it's a new word, look it up because you never know it might show up on the GRE. For text completion, again, text completion is where you have a sentence or passage with anywhere from one to three blanks, and you have to fill in those blanks. Before even looking at the answer choices, just read over the passage. Um, get a feel for the style and the tone um, of the passage. Look for, you know, clues among the, um, the parts that don't have blanks. Look for signal words. These, you know, words that cause a strong feeling one way or the other may kind of guide you to what type of answer they're looking for to go in that blank, okay? Um, try to fill in the blanks yourself too. Use your own sense of style and, and knowledge of language as you're first reading it. What words do you think might go there? And then back it up with support from the parts of the sentence or passage that don't have blanks. Um, find one blank to start with, work from there. Um, as I said, try to plug in your own words first. Maybe you might pick the right word, or if not, find a synonym among the answer choices. And then once you've picked your answers, always reread it at the end to make sure it all makes sense together once you're finished with it. Okay. Um, for sentence equivalents, remember, these are the ones that have one blank, and there's, you're supposed to pick two words that give the sentence the same meaning. Okay. Um, now, it may be tempting to just look for synonyms among the answer choices and pick two words that mean the same thing. Um, if you're running out of time and you have no, nothing better to go on, then sure, go for it. Pick two synonyms and move on. But if you've got the time to sit and look at it more, um, try to fill in the blank yourself. Again, maybe you might pick the right word or find synonyms to the word that you would put in the blank. Um, and then also, if two synonyms do work, they must be the correct answer. So if you are working on a sentence equivalence question, and you are eliminating words that can't be the right word for this sentence, that just doesn't make sense. A lot of times it's pretty easy to eliminate like three of the answer choices and you're left with three answer choices and you've got to pick two from them, okay? Let's say this happens, you've got three words to choose from, you know two of the words, you don't know the third word, okay? If the two words you know are not synonyms, do not pick both of them because if they don't give the sentence the same meaning, you will not get any credit on that answer. So you kind of have to take a little gamble here. Pick one of the words you know and the one you don't, because that's the best chance you have of actually getting credit for that question, okay? So don't pick two words that don't give the sentence the same meaning just because you know what they mean. And if you have to stretch to make it fit to give it the same meaning, it's not the answer you're looking for. There are going to be two in the GRE writer's eyes, two perfect answers to go there. So sometimes you have to take a gamble and pick the word you don't know to have a better chance of actually getting the right answer. Okay. Um, and as I think I've said a couple times and I'll repeat again, um, reading and vocabulary are the best ways to succeed on the verbal section. The more words you learn, the more successful you'll be. Fun fact, I think you're expected to know 50,000 words for the SAT and you're expected to know 70,000 words for the GRE. Um, of course, it may be hard to figure it out if you've actually learned 20,000 new words in college. Um, another resource that I have that I'm very happy to share with you if you email me is a list of 333 most frequently used words on the GRE in the past 20 years. It's a one or two sided document I have. I'm happy to email to you. So just email me again, brandy.blue at ucf.edu. If we were in person, I would hand it to you. Um, so this worksheet here can help you with getting an idea of some commonly used words on the GRE. If you're going to work with this list, um, the way I recommend working with it is as follows. First, 
Look for words that you almost know, but you're not really quite comfortable using in a sentence because a little bit more work and you'll have those words mastered. Um, so spend some time with the words you almost have so that you can really feel comfortable using them in a sentence and knowing um, when they might be used on the GRE exam. So that's the first group of words. Second group of words, you'll want to focus on words you think you know, but you don't. So as you're looking up each of these words, if you're kind of surprised by the definition of a word you run across, oh, I thought that meant something completely different. Because, you know, we all have those friends that use words, um, big words, and, you know, you just kind of trust that they know that they're using it correctly, but maybe they're not. Um, so you might get the wrong definition associated with the word. So if you do have any wrong definitions associated with a word, break that as fast as you can, because you don't want to see that word on test day and think it means something completely different than what it actually means. So work on those words, the words you think you know, but you don't. That way they can't trick you on test day. Also, as you're working with words, think of secondary and tertiary meanings for words, um, because sometimes the GRE will test you on those. Um, for example, the word list, right? If you think of the word list, probably the most common definition that comes to mind is something like a word list, a list of words or your shopping list, right? But there's another definition for the word list. It can also mean to lean from side to side, to be listless, lacking in energy, right? So on the GRE, if you're working with these text completions or sentence equivalence questions and you see a deceptively simple word among the answer choice and you're like, there's no way this could be the right answer, maybe stop and think, hmm, what other definition might they be using for this word? Um, because those are, words, those are some of the words that can be tricky as well. So again, if you see a very simple word on this word list, think about other possible definitions that the jury may be getting at so that they can't trick you on test day, okay? Okay, so that is the tips and tricks I have for the verbal section in general. Any questions about reading comprehension, sentence equivalence, text completion, or vocabulary in general for the GRE before I move on to tips for math? All righty. If you do, feel free to type them in the chat. Otherwise, I'll keep talking. So math section. There are two graded math sections on the GRE exam. You will have 20 qu questions. You will have 35 minutes per section, okay? And math can kind of be broken down into four different content areas, the types of questions you'll see. There's arithmetic questions, there's algebra questions, geometry questions, and what they call data analysis, or basically look at a graph or table and answer some questions about these graphs or this table, okay? The jury website has a list of all of the expected math skills that they will be willing to test you on on the jury exam. So if you go there and skim over that document, it can tell you everything you have to know. Okay. Um, but like I said, it really is stuff that goes up to like intermediate algebra, very basic math in high school. And again, if you took advanced math in high school, it might have even been middle school math for you. So I think that's what makes the math section trickier is that it's harder to remember all of these things you may have learned and not used for a while. Even if you're in a STEM field, like you've been doing calculus and stuff like that for a while. Um, so trying to remember the very basic math might require a little bit of dusting off of that toolbox in your head. Um, the main reason they have a math section is because it is a good test for problem solving skills. And they use this type of math because you have to have passed all this math to get into college in the first place. So you have learned what you need to know. You have the tools. They just may be hiding in a corner covered in dust and cobwebs because you haven't used them for a while. So it's now it's time to pull that toolbox off and dust it off, open it up and see what tools can help you solve what kinds of problems. Um, types of questions you'll see, again, just like with the reading section, you'll have traditional multiple choice, pick, you know, one of these five answers. You may have some that are one or more correct answers, select all that apply. You may have free response or numeric entry as they call them. This is where they don't give you any answers to choose from and you must type the correct answer in the box. There's only a handful of these per test though, so it's not the majority of the ones you'll see by far. As I mentioned, those data analysis questions, you'll have three of those per math section, so six total on your test, that will count towards your score. They'll give you some chart or your graphs and ask you questions about the chart or graphs and you've gotta you know, use the chart and graphs to answer those questions. 
And then there's also quantitative comparisons. These make up about half of your math questions and are very likely to be a new question type for you. So quantitative comparisons basically boil down to which one is bigger. They'll have column A and they'll have column B. There'll be something in each of these columns. There may be some information in between them that's shared across both columns. And you have to essentially say which one is bigger. Is A always bigger? Is B always bigger? Are they always the same? Or D, which can be like none of the above, or in, I think of it as it depends. Okay, sometimes one is bigger, sometimes the other is bigger. So I'll talk a little bit more about those specifically in a bit. Um, they designed this, um, you know, resi uh, redesigned GRE was designed with more real world math problems and translations, or so they say, you know, hopefully more like something you might see in the real world. And that's why there's a, a focus on those data analysis questions and things like that. Um, and you may even see data sets in non data analysis problems. So it's not specifically a question about that um, chart or graph, but there may be a chart or graph involved with answering the question. Okay, so some general math tips. Know your formulas. Like I said, they will not provide a formula cheat sheet. You must have them memorized. Again, I have a cheat sheet for practicing. Do not use it when you take the test. Um, but when you're preparing for the exam, I have a nice cheat sheet. Email me at brandy.blue at ucf.edu, and I'm very happy to share it with you. When you're doing answering a math question, don't do more math than you have to. Um, you may be used to working your way through a, pro a, pr a problem showing your work from point A to point B. Um, you may not have time to do that on all of the math questions on the GRE exam. So do what you need to do to get to the answer. Again, don't worry about showing your work because nobody's grading your work. All you're doing is picking the right answer on the computer test. So if you can figure out with those quantitative comparison questions, oh, hey, look, they're equal. Oh, hey, they're not. The answer is D. I don't have to prove anything more beyond that. So just do enough math as you need to to get to the answer. Don't forget you have a calculator. It's useful for doing some, you know, painful arithmetic, but also don't overuse the calculator. Um, don't, please don't be plugging in like what's two times two in the calculator. Get comfortable with numbers and math again that you can do some of it in your head because it will make the math section a lot quicker. Um, but if it is math that is not designed to be done in your head, use the calculator. It is there, okay? Sometimes they'll show you drawings on the exam, um, especially with these geometry questions. Don't assume those drawings are to scale. They may draw that triangle to look like an equilateral triangle. If you remember, that's a triangle that has all three sides the same. So you may start thinking about all the rules you've learned about what applies for an equilateral triangle. But unless they give you information that makes it have to be to scale, um, like if you see all three sides are the same length, hooray, then it is an equilateral triangle. Maybe you can treat it as such. Um, but unless they say this drawing is to scale or they give you information where it has to be the same, don't assume. It may be really useful to redraw their drawings in another way so that you don't accidentally start applying rules to this geometry problem that may not apply, okay? Um, it can be really useful to draw pictures um, to make the shape that you need to, serve, to solve a word problem to just draw what something is, what something looks like when you're reading a word problem to make it more real, concrete. Um, you've got scratch paper, use it. You know, obviously you're, you know to use math, uh, scratch paper to do math, but it may be useful for drawing pictures to conceptualize what's going on in a problem. Or if you have a geometry problem, you have square S and rectangle R and you know, this one's twice as big as that one. Draw what that looks like because it may help you see what they're looking for. When you're working on word problems and especially, always keep in mind what are you looking for because they may give you a whole bunch of information about X but then ask you to solve for Y. Don't do more math than you have to, but also make sure you do enough math to get to the answer you're looking for. So I'll, always, I always write little notes to myself on my scratch paper, you know, Y equals question mark and then start doing the other stuff I need to do. And when I solve for Y, I know I've got my answer that I need. Um, some of the more complicated geometry problems involve find the area of the shaded region, or they might have um, shapes drawn in other shapes or shapes that we don't have a formula for. Um, like what's the area of this house, um, which you know, maybe is a triangle and a square together, okay? Al almost always the way to solve these questions is to use the area formulas that we know, because we're going to learn them before we take the GRE, and either add them or subtract them in such a way 
that you are left with the area you're looking for. So like I said, if we're gonna find the area of a house, which is like a square with a triangle on top, find the area of the square, find the area of the triangle, add them together. If I have like a circle inside a circle inside a circle, and there's a shaded one in the middle, kind of like a target, right? Um, like a bullseye for shooting archery. You probably need to find the area of the bigger circle and subtract the area of a smaller circle until you're left with just that shaded area. So try to figure out what areas you can find and subtract them until you're just left with the shaded area. I think those are some of the more harder math questions you'll see. Um, when you're doing a numeric entry question, this is again the one where you type in the answer instead of picking one. Um, don't forget about rounding. Very often they'll say round to the nearest whole percent, round to the nearest tenth, round to the nearest hundredth. Make sure you do that because if you don't round correctly, even if you had the right answer, it's not the right answer. You got to make sure you do the rounding correctly. Um, and as a reminder, five and up means you round up. Below five means you round down. And then data analysis. These are the, the charts and graphs, right? Um, don't be afraid to estimate things where possible. Like if the chart is showing something like 19% here and 21% there, it may not be a bad idea to round to 20 to make the number easier to work with. Graphs are designed to present data in a visual fashion to make it easier to eyeball and see what's going on with the data set. So don't be afraid to use that to your advantage. Um, don't round too far, but you can round a little bit to get whole round numbers to work with. And then just pick the answer that is closest to what you solve for um, when, you are, when you're done with doing your math. Okay. Okay, um, some more math uh, tips and tricks. So with word problems, um, sometimes it can be really useful to use some of these trips, like uh, tricks like back solving, um, plug and chug, you know, take the answers, plug them in, see which one works, right? Very common trick, we probably all use it on the SAT at one point or the other. So if you're not sure what to do with the math problem, you can try, if they give you the answers, plug in the answers until you see which one works. When you're doing this, I recommend starting with answer choice C. The reason being is that the GRE often, almost always, arranges your answers in ascending or descending order. So if you pick C, you're uh, checking the middle answer choice. And hopefully from there you can figure out, do I need to go higher or lower? And then you can narrow down your search of answer choices. So if you started with A every time and the answer is E, you have to check all five of them. But if you start with C and realize, oh, I need to go bigger, then you just check maybe D and E until you get to the right answer. So that's fewer ones you have to check and a quicker way to get through that question, okay? Again, this is a great plan for if you can't remember or decide how to start a problem or you start solving a problem and you get stuck. Don't just assume that, well, I guess I'm not getting this one. See if you can back solve, see if you can um, you know, plug those answers in and, and get the right answer. And this can often be quicker than the real intended way. And as I said, nobody's looking at your work. All they care is that you got the answer. So um, I, I always laugh a bit because um, Rex and I were both uh, test prep instructors at the same time for a while. And every time I come to Rex with a math problem I'd get stuck on, this is the strategy he would go to. This one and the next one I'm going to show you. Because again, it, they don't care whether you do it the right way, they just wanna see that you can solve a problem. And so if they give you answers, solve the problem using those answers to see which one works. And then picking numbers is another one. And this one, I wish I would have had when I took the GRE myself back in the day. This is such a useful um, way to approach problems that you get stuck on. So if you can't find the numbers to do math with, if they don't actually give you numbers in the problem, just pick your own numbers to work with. Because you know, for a lot of us, we know how to do the math, we know how to find a percentage, we know how to multiply, um, but we can't always see how that works in maybe a, a formula or a variable set, or you know, if you're just talking about this percent or that percent, like we need numbers to work with. And so this, you can pick your own numbers if they don't give you numbers to work with. It works great when you have variables in your question and in your answer choices. It also works great when you're dealing with what are called number relationship problems. If you're dealing with percents, ratios, fractions, these aren't about like hard numbers. It's about the relationship between those numbers. So pick your own. It can also help with number of properties problems you'll see in comparative, uh, qualitative compar no, sorry, quantitative comparisons. So when you're going to pick your own numbers, remember to be nice to yourself. They don't have to be realistic numbers. A school can have 10 students. A cafeteria can use two cans of soup to get through the week. Like whatever makes the most sense for you, pick numbers that play nice together and pick numbers that are easier to work with in your head. Um, you'll thank yourself for it. So 
if you're looking at a question and you're asking yourself, okay, so what is the actual math I need to do? This may be a great time to pick your own numbers so that you can then do that math that you need to do, okay? Quantitative comparison questions. Again, these make up about half of the math questions you'll see on the GRE. Um, so it is good to know, have a strategy for how to approach those. Um, when I'm approaching them, the first thing I try to do is make the answer be D. If I can make the answer be D, then the answer is D and I don't have to do any more math. How do I do this? My favorite way to do it is, can I make them equal? Can I make them not equal? So you might have a quantitative comparison question and column A is X and column B is two X. Okay, so then the, and the question is essentially, which one is bigger? Well, okay, what happens if X is zero? X is zero, then it's zero. If two X and X is zero, then two X is zero. Hey, they're both zero, I made them equal. Now, what if I put almost any other number in there? They're not gonna be equal anymore, right? So if they're equal and they're not equal, the answer is D, I can stop. I don't have to do any more math and prove that I could also get A or anything else. The answer is D. So if I can make them equal and the answer and not equal, the answer is D. If um, the first two numbers I pick don't work and I need to test all different types of numbers, there's um, four different types of numbers you wanna test on quantitative comparison questions. Um, and they are zero because zero has certain properties a fraction or a decimal, because those numbers have certain types of properties. I usually use 0.5, um, a positive number, and I usually avoid one or two unless I can kind of see what's gonna happen with this question because one and two also have some properties that can trick you up. So three is a good one to start with, and a negative number. So if, if you test zero, a fraction or decimal, a positive number, and a negative number, and every time you test it, you get the same column is bigger, then that's gonna be your answer because those are all the number properties they're testing for, okay? Um, if you can get any two of them, any two different answers, either A is bigger or B is bigger or they're the same, hooray, the answer is D, okay? Now, if you're working with a problem, a quantitative comparison question, there are no variables involved, nothing changes. The area of a triangle with these sides versus the area of a square with those sides. Okay, if there's nothing variable, nothing can change, the answer can't be D because one of them will always be bigger than the other or they will always be equal. If you are trying to get through some math questions because you're running out of time um, and there's no variables involved, if you're gonna eeny, meeny, miny, mo, don't do it with D, eeny, meeny, miny, mo between A, B, and C, okay? But if there are variables, then try to make it D. And if you can't make the answer be D, then you found the right answer, whatever that answer is. Now, on questions where there are variables and there's no constraints, constraints are information about the problem. Like if I go back to my X versus 2X and X has to be, you know, greater than one or something, that's a constraint, okay? But if they just have X versus 2X and there's no constraints, the answer is probably going to be D. So if you have to guess because you're really not sure what else to do with it, if there's variables and there's no constraints, the answer is more likely to be D than any other answer. Because again, these different number properties, like from zero, decimals or fractions, positive and negative numbers, they all do very different things. And so they're more likely to give different answers, which then leads you to the answer of D. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Okay. All right, so at this point, I've covered all the different format and functionality of the exam and the different content of the um, areas of the exam. Um, I know my workshop tends to be a little longer than most because I also have these um, practice questions at the end. Um, but at this point, I've covered all of the lecture part. And from here, um, I can go into practice questions with you. So if you do need to leave, go to class, get dinner, what have you, um, I won't be offended at this point. Rex, if you're listening, maybe you can link the um, survey again for them. Um, but if you want to hang out with me and do some practice, practice questions, I'm very happy to continue to keep going with that. Um, before I start though, does anyone have any other questions about any of the topics I've covered so far? Thanks, Rex. Thank you to everyone who was able to stay for this part. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Hope you all have the best of luck on the GRE kick butt on it. Again, if you have questions for me, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm very happy to respond to GRE questions, whether it's general or 
I have this specific math question. I don't know what the answer is. Please help. Anything in between, I'm happy to help with um, via email. And again, don't forget to email me at brandy.blue at ucf.edu for my nifty resources, the uh, vocabulary list and the formula sheet. Okie dokie. All right, so this is my first time teaching this through Zoom. So we may be a little bit guinea pigs here, but what I'm gonna start doing, um, I guess we'll work through these questions together, I think is how I prefer to do this. So um, we'll read this paragraph and talk about the answer choices and you guys, we're all gonna try to see if we can figure out what the correct answer is. Hold on, let's see if I can. Hmm. Trying to see if I can get out of full screen mode so I can pull up my answer guide here, but I guess not, all right. All right, so Jupiter has 2.5 times more mass than all the other planets of the solar system combined and is 11 times as large as Earth in diameter. Jupiter is so large that scientists believe it almost became a star. As the gases and dust contracted to form the planet, gravitational forces created tremendous pressure and temperature inside the core as high as tens of thousands of degrees. But there was not enough mass available to create the temperature needed to start a fusion reaction, such as that of the sun above 27 million Fahrenheit or 15 million Celsius at the sun's core. Thus, Jupiter has been cooling down ever since. Even so, Jupiter radiates about as much heat as it receives from the sun. Um, so the question asks, the passage is mainly concerned with. This is basically asking what's the main topic. So among those answer uh, choices, do any of them jump out as being obviously the right answer or obviously a wrong answer? E looks like an obvious wrong. You said E is an elephant? Yes, E is an elephant is an obvious wrong. Yeah, that's very uh, specific. So that's not going to be the answer there for sure. Yep. So not E. Other thoughts? All right, I see same with D being an obvious wrong. Again, that's a very specific point. So that's not going to be the main topic here. So now we're still looking at A, B, and C. I think C is the correct answer. That is a good thought, yes. Because um, A and B are also still very specific facts in this paragraph here. Um, but C more encapsulates all these different ways that they talked about how Jupiter's mass affected its development. So C is going to be your best choice answer here. The other ones are just too, too narrow, too specific um, for this particular paragraph. Anyone have questions or wants to argue against that uh, answer being the right answer? Matt, we'll move on to the next one. Yeah, okay. All right, so we're going to use the same passage again, and this will happen with your. Um, reading comprehension passages. Um, and that a lot of times you'll have one passage and you'll have two to five questions on that passage. Um, you'll always be able to see the passage. Um, if you move on to the next question, the passage will stay there and you'll still see the question. Um, so next question is, which of the following can be inferred from the passage? Select all that apply. If I was better at um, PowerPoint, those would be boxes in front of those answer choices, which means we might want more than one correct answer here. Any answers look obviously correct or obviously incorrect? I believe A is incorrect because it has vocabulary that's not even in the passage. That's a very good point. Yeah, A goes beyond knowledge from the passage, um, so it's not going to be the right answer here. B also is a wrong answer. It's too extreme because um, we can't say all observable stars in the galaxy formed at this point. Um, we don't know that information. So A is not going to work and B is not going to work. What about C? Hopefully that one looks good. 
And yeah, so C is is right because we do talk about how the mass of a planet um, can have an effect on the temperature of its core. It doesn't specifically state that because we're inferring it from the passage. But if you read the passage, it's talking about how Jupiter's mass, um, you know, has has had an effect on the temperature at its core. So C is going to be the right answer here. When it comes to these select all that apply, at least one answer must be correct. There will not be a case where zero answers are correct. So if you're playing any mini mini mo guess, at least put one answer in there. Um, don't leave it completely blank. Okay. Brandy, really quick. Yeah. So for a question where it has select all possible answers, if for some reason, let's say there's two correct answers, but we only selected one correct answer, does it count as a partial or the whole thing is wrong? There is no partial credit. So you must okay. take all of the correct answers and only the correct answers to receive credit for the question. Thank you. Yep, no problem. All right, any other questions on reading comprehension? Or on this one, I should say, because I think I've got one more. Okay. All right, so this one is a little bit of a shorter one because um, this is a nice example of a logical reasoning passage. Although there are no physical differences between the visual organs of the two groups, the inhabitants of the bilge islands, when shown a card displaying a spectrum of colors, perceived fewer colors than do most persons in the United States. So the question is, which of the following conclusions can most reliably be drawn from the information above? Um, we're talking about conclusions, so that makes this um, less of a traditional question, more of a logical reasoning type. So do any of these answers jump out as being obviously right or obviously wrong? A seems to be obviously right because there's no extremes in it. Yeah, that's good that you're able to jump straight to that one. Yes, A is the correct answer because um, basically the other ones all require pulling in outside knowledge. Um, I know for me, anytime I read any passages that are like psychology or sociology based, because I didn't mention, but my undergraduate degrees are in sociology and psychology. And so I always kept trying to pull in this extra information, things I've learned about, you know, society, social structures and things like that. But that's not what this passage talks about. So it's really important to almost forget everything you know about your subject area um, other than vocabulary when doing these reading comprehensions. So stick to the, the answer choice that does that really just sticks to what's in the passage and does not pull anything from outside. But yes, A is the correct answer on this one. Any questions on that one or any questions on why A is right or why one of the other ones is, are wrong? All right, so this is an example of a text completion question. For text completion, you'll want to fill each blank or select one entry from the corresponding column of choices, fill all blanks in the way that best completes the text. So again, blank one um, corresponds to column one, blank two corresponds to column two. The author's blank style renders a fascinating subject, the role played by luck in everyday life, extraordinarily blank. When you're approaching these text completion questions, sometimes you may find it easier to fill the later blanks and work your way backwards um, because a lot of times the first blank is left deliberately vague. And as you start filling in correct blanks later in the passage, it makes it easier to fill in the first ones. Not always the case, but a lot of times filling in from the end back to the beginning tends to be a, a good strategy. So if I'm approaching the second blank here, um, you know, we're talking about the author's blank style renders a fascinating subject, the role played by luck in everyday life, extraordinarily, what kind of word could even go here? Um, probably either a word that means fascinating or not fascinating, right? Are the only possible answers here. Um, and we're talking about how the style makes this subject, this fascinating subject blank. So either fascinating or not fascinating. So yeah, the, fa the, the fact that the word extraordinarily is there means we probably don't want a word that means fascinating. We want one that means boring. Um, and while D is a close choice, there's actually a better choice for boring among those three words. Tedious, yes, tedious means boring. Um, pedantic can be boring, but that's not a primary part of its definition. Um, but tedious, like, is boring. That is the definition of the word. So we're going to go ahead and pick E tedious to go in that second blank. 
So the author's blank style makes this really awesome subject really boring. So then what kind of style is this author going to use? Is it going to be an engaging and enlivening style or something that makes it boring? Probably something that makes it boring. So do any of those first words either indicate something that can be made boring or doesn't mean boring at all, we can eliminate it. So I see colloquial tossed out. Not exactly, because again, part of the, you have to look for something that's a key part of that definition. That's where really knowing a word's definition and not just kind of being able to roll with it in context works well. Colloquial has to do with using more like local terms and local flavor of describing something. It's more um, regional language. And so regional language in and of itself is not boring or exciting. It's kind of neutral. So colloquial is not the best choice among the words we have here. Soporific does not necessarily mean common. Soporific is probably a word that not very many people would have run into. Because um, we probably know colloquial, because colloquialisms, local turns of phrase. Um, lucid, um, if you don't know, is a good one to know for the jury, commonly shows up, it means clear. Um, and so, yeah, even if you knew lucid and colloquial and you've never seen soporific before, you can probably eliminate those two and pick uh, soporific. Um, but just so you know, soporific means sleep inducing. It puts you to sleep. So in this case, it's a perfect way to describe an author's style that takes something really exciting and makes it really boring. Okay, so the correct answer choices for this one would be soporific and tedious. The author's soporific style renders a fascinating subject, the role played by luck in everyday life, extraordinarily tedious. Okay, so again, yeah, use process of elimination where you can. If, again, you have to be comfortable sometimes picking that word you don't know, because if the word you do know is not a perfect fit, it is not the word jury makers are looking for. They, in their opinion, there is a perfect word for this blank. So if you have to stretch to make the word you know work, odds are it's the word you don't know that's the right answer. Okay. Any questions on that one or any other definitions from this page that we didn't talk about? I think opaque is the only one we didn't mention. Lucid is clear and easy to see through. Opaque is cloudy and hard to see through or hard to understand. Let's see. Okay. And then this is an example of a sentence equivalence, um, which again, if I was better at PowerPoint, there would be boxes in front of these answer choices. The boxes, again, remind you, you may want more than one correct answer. In this case, we want two. So we want to select the two answer choices that, when used to complete the sentence, fit the meaning of a sentence as a whole and produce complete sentences that are alike in meaning. The evil of class and race hatred must be eliminated while it is still in blank state. Otherwise, it may grow to dangerous proportions. Okay. Do any of those words jump out? Or are there any words that we might want to pay attention to in this sentence to give us an idea of what kind of word we want? So I see um, we're looking for a word that means like beginning. Yes. Um, what... Uh, because we see the word grow in there, grow to dangerous proportions. So we're probably looking for something that hasn't yet grown, something that is in a beginning stage of life, perhaps. Um, so I see somebody said, F looks like one right answer, embryonic. Yes, that definitely implies something that hasn't grown up yet. Um, and then ooh, rudimentary, yes, that is another one. That is the other correct answer. Because um, rudimentary, again, indicates an undeveloped or ungrown state. Amorphous may be tempting because something that is amorphous may not be as threatening because it doesn't have a, a fully formed shape yet. But rudimentary and embryonic both have that growth implied in them. They have not grown yet. And so they are better choices than amorphous because something can start amorphous and remain amorphous like an amoeba forever. Amorphous does not have to gain a shape. But rudimentary indicates it's at a, a beginning stage, it will grow. And embryonic, again, is a beginning stage of life, it will grow. So F and C are your best choices here. Any questions on this one or other definitions needed? Okie dokie, math questions. Um, how am I doing on time? Ooh, okay. 
Um, so I know it's about four o'clock now. So again, if I don't want to keep anybody too long, if you have other things you need to be doing, but if you want me to do some math questions, I'm happy to hang around a little bit longer because I don't have other things I need to be doing right this moment. Um, but again, um, if you do need to leave, again, I will not be offended. I appreciate your time. You can always email me with any other questions you might have. Um, but I will move on for anyone who wants to hang out with me still. Um, <clears throat> so this is an example of a traditional question for math where you have answer choices to choose from. If 5x plus 32 equals 4 minus 2x, what is the value of x? Um, what is one way I can solve this? Start with C by plugging it in and then... Yep, so I can plug and chug my answer choices and see which one ends up working. Um, so if I start with C, 5 times 4 is 20 plus 32 is 52. Does that equal 4? No, that's not going to equal it. I don't even have to get the whole answer. Like that, that's not going to work. Um, so I probably need to do something smaller because I ended up with something way too big on the left side and way too small on the right hand side. So, uh, so looking at the negatives, um, let's try A. Um, if 5 times negative four is going to be negative 20 plus 32 is going to leave me with 12. And then if I have, correct me if I make a mistake on math, um, I'm rusty, it's been a while and I don't have my calculator handy. Um, so if I say something that sounds really dumb in math, do not hesitate to call me out. Anyways, negative 20 plus 32 is 12. Then we have, yeah, four minus two times negative four, is negative eight minus negative makes positive. So I end up with four plus eight. So that's 12. I got 12 on both sides, hooray. And I do like um, George is pointing out here, the answer has to be even. So negative four has to be it. Again, don't be afraid to take shortcuts like this um, on the GRE math section. If you recognize like, oh, it only has to be even. I'm, I'm gonna make them be even numbers or, you know, oh, I need a positive answer or a negative answer. Um, you, can, you can feel free to just test the ones that make sense. You don't have to test everything. Um, the proper way to do it would be to solve for x. So if it's been a while since you've done algebra, when you're solving for x, you know, you need to move all, well, do anything in parentheses, do anything in exponents, move all the x to one side. So I would have 5x, the other side has negative 2x, so I need to add 2x. So 5x plus 2x is 7x plus 32 equals 4. So 7x plus 32 equals 4. Get everything that's not x on the other side. 4 minus 32 is negative 28. So I have 7x equals negative 28. Divide both sides by 7 because I just want 1x, not 7x's. And then I end up with x equals negative 4. So if you're comfortable with algebra and just want to solve for x, do that. That's fine. Like, it's okay to solve problems the, the right way. But if you get stuck or you forget, that's where this back solving and picking numbers can be really handy. Um, but regardless of how you solve it, the answer ends up being negative 4. All right, this is one where um, you may want more than one correct answer. Again, if this was on the jury, you would have boxes in front of the answer choices. Um, select one or more answer choices according to the specific question directions. Which of the following integers are multiples of both two and three? Indicate all such integers. Um, so sometimes with these types of questions, you can figure out a range of possible answers and just pick the ones that fit in that range. Um, this one is more of a testing each of the different answers or at least looking at them to decide whether you can eliminate them or not. Um, so we're looking for integers that are multiples of both two and three. Remember multiples are things like two, four, five, uh, two, four, six, eight, or three, six, nine, twelve, right? Multiply to make them bigger. And so to be a multiple both two and three, it needs to be a multiple of six. So really if we just look for multiples of six, we will find our answers. Um, so we've got uh, C which is 12, yep. Uh, D, which is 18. Yep. Is there any others here? 36. Yep. F. Um, so again, you can know like if for it to be an integer of both two and three, it needs to be an integer of six. Um, sometimes this may pop up too. Maybe easier just remember, okay, multiples of two are things that are even because all even numbers are multiples of two. Multiples of three, if you add up the digits, and the number you get is divisible by three, that entire number is divisible by three. So I could also just test the even numbers that have digits that add up to a number that is divisible by three. So if I was doing it that way, I would say, okay, not eight, because that's not divisible by three, not nine, because it's not even. 12, one plus two is three, it's even, so C counts. 
18, one plus eight is nine divisible by three, it's even, that one counts. 21, nope, that's odd. And then 36, three plus six is nine, divisible by three, it's even, it counts. So those are two different ways I can approach that one, either just using the answer choices or using what I know about um, multiples and integers. Questions on that one? Okay, yeah, this one's usually a lot easier to do on a whiteboard. So rectangle R has a length of 30 and a width of 10 and square S has a length of five. The perimeter of S is what fraction of the perimeter of R? This is a numeric entry. We're gonna to need to plug in the right numbers. So we're gonna to have to remember a couple of formulas for this one. Um, how do I find the perimeter of a square? It's the side given times four. Yes. Four times the side, because remember a square all ha has the same side, same length sides, so four times the length of the side. So the perimeter of S is going to be four times five, which is 20. Rectangle, how do I find the perimeter of a rectangle? Twice the width and twice the length added yeah. together. Yep, so yeah, adding up all the sides, but we have two lengths and two widths. So two times L would be 30 times two, which is 60. W times two, 10 times two is 20, so 60 plus 20 is 80. So the perimeter of S is 20, the perimeter of R is 80. How do I put this in my fraction? One fourth? Yes, exactly. So I could put it in as 20 over 80. Um, I could put it in as two over eight, I could put it in as one over four. When it comes to numeric entry, you don't have to reduce it to the lowest common terms. Um, you can just, as long as it's an equivalent fraction, you can plug it in and it will be correct. So again, you don't do more math than you have to. You can put, you don't have to simplify. No, it is not required. Just make sure that all the numbers fit in there in the boxes. Um, but as long as all of your numbers fit, then in its equivalent fraction, it will work. Of course, if you automatically simplify anyways, there's no harm in simplifying, but you just don't have to. Questions on that one? Okay. This is an example of a data analysis question. Um, so they gave us some charts here to look at. If the dollar amount of sales at store P was 800,000 for 2006, what was the dollar amount of sales at that store for 2008? Um, so when you're working with data analysis, make sure you're looking at the correct column or row or line or bar or whatever from that graph we need to. So we would look at company, or sorry, store P. And it looked like from 2006 to 2007, it went up 10%. So to find, that 10% increase, I can take 800,000, multiply it by 0.1 and add it, or I can take 800,000 and multiply it by 1.1, and that will give me my original 800,000 plus the 10%. So that's gonna get me up to um, 880,000. From 2007, 2008, it went down 10%. So again, I could multiply that, sorry, multiply 880,000 by 0 0.1 and subtract it, or I can multiply 880,000 by 0 0.9 because that's taking that 10% away from the whole. So that does it for me all in one step. Um, <clears throat> and if I do that, um, it will not end up um, with answer choice C because you have to do both steps of it. Yeah, that's a trick to this because just because it went up 10% and came down 10%, remember that percents deal with number relationships. And so it's 10% of what? The first time it's 10% of 800,000. The next time it's a 10% of a different number. So you're gonna end up um, actually with answer choice um, B, I'm pretty sure I don't have my answer choice, or answer key open in front of me, but you're gonna end up a little lower than where you started. Yeah. All right. So again, when it comes to percent questions, I recommend not taking shortcuts on the, like work that out, 10% of what, and actually do that math because it's very easy. Don't treat percents like they are actual numbers. They are a number relationship. Um, so it's better to just go ahead and do that math and skip it. It keeps you from making mistakes. Okay, questions on that one? Okay. Three more to go, I think. All right, so these, this is an example of a quantitative comparison question, right? 
This one is obviously overly simplified though. So column A, you have two times six. Column B, you have two plus six, okay? And your answer choices are A always stands for A is always bigger. B always stands for B is always bigger. C always stands for they are always equal. And D, that's the blurb they give you, but really it's best to think of D as it depends, okay? And if there isn't a way for it to depend, you can't pick D. So if this was actually a question put in front of you, the correct answer choice would obviously be A, as I see in the chat, because two times six is 12, and two plus six is eight, and 12 is always bigger than eight, but they won't usually be this straightforward. Instead, you might see something like this one, okay? So in column A, we have x squared. In column B, we have 2x. If you're faced with a question like this and you don't automatically know the answer off the top of your head, don't be afraid to pick numbers to plug in and solve. And again, we wanna make sure we pick different types of numbers. So yeah, if I pick, say for example, x is zero. What is zero squared? Zero. What is two times x? Zero. Does zero equal zero? Yes. So I made the answer C if X equals zero. Now I'm going to pick a different number. Let's go with um, one, okay? Just to pick a different number. One squared is one, two times one is two. Oh, they're not equal. So I made them equal, I made them not equal. So my answer has to be D. And I don't have to test anything else because I already made the answer be D. Once you have two different answers, the answer is D, you can stop. All right, here's another one added uh, something to it. So x squared plus one versus two x minus one. So I'm gonna go ahead and test my different number types. If I put in zero, zero squared is zero plus one gives me one in column A. Two times x is zero minus one gives me negative one. So in this case, I made column A bigger, okay? Let's pick, um, let's go with a negative number. Um, negative three squared is going to give me positive nine. Nine plus one is 10. Um, no, that doesn't help me out here. I think I'm gonna end up with A bigger on that one too. So not as helpful. Let's try a fraction. Um, if I have 0.5 squared, I would plug this prime in the calculator to make sure I don't make a mistake, but 0.5 times 0.5 is 0.25 plus one gives me 1.25. If I have two times 0.5, that'll give me one minus one gives me zero. So A is still bigger. 